Okay, hi guys. My name's Henry. I'm founder and CEO at Streamer. And it's magnificent to be here. I've like watched all the talks from the previous dev cons and I decided that that's what I want to do. That's where I want to be. And I'm here. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> So thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to introduce Streamer to you briefly, tell you what the vision is, how it works. I'm going to do a live demo and spend most of my time on that. If the Wi-Fi gods permit, it will go well. Uh, and in the end, I'll talk about how Streamer fits into a decentralized service stack consisting of Streamer and other projects that offer services for decentralized application development. So let's jump into it. So Streamer aims to tokenize the value in real-time data. For example, let's consider a self-driving electric vehicle. Now, to deliver the best possible passenger experience, the car needs, it constantly needs data from other machines, such as traffic congestion information from other cars, um, electricity prices on nearby charging stations, weather forecasts, and so on. So Streamer provides a single interface for the car to go out and subscribe to the data it needs and pay for it using a cryptographic token called the Streamer data coin, which lives on the Ethereum blockchain. Now, the car is also a data producer. It can sell the data it produces, such as traffic information to other cars, road condition measurements to smart cities, passenger blood sugar level uh, to nearby advertisers <laughs> or whatever. So a data stream economy emerges. Streamers implemented as a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network for data delivery. So a data source can connect to any node in the network, publish a message, and it instantly gets delivered to valid subscribers. So we aim for the low latency, high throughput uh, use case uh, in, a, in a pub sub, in a massively scalable pub sub pattern. Um, <clears throat> the streamer network is designed to horizontally scale up to potentially billions of events per second using a, a clever sharding scheme. So sharding works by dividing the whole data flow going through the network into independent partitions and assigning asymmetric responsibilities for nodes in the network using a reputation mechanism. So the streamer network is an, it's an off-chain companion network which uses um, an underlying blockchain for security critical operations such as value transfers and access control. So decentralization is achieved by allowing anyone to run a node in the network and contribute bandwidth to the network and storage um, in exchange for, for tokens as a re reward. So the network is run by its users uh, instead of giant corporations, which means that you own, control, and monetize the data that you produce. Of course, decentralization also makes the network more robust against attacks and node failures, helping guarantee the delivery of data in all circumstances. Now, in addition to the scalable messaging infrastructure, we are also building two applications. A marketplace which allows the data producers and data consumers to find each other. It's kind of like the app store for data streams. Um, <clears throat> raw data is usually not very useful as is, right? Some kind of computation is needed. Filtering, aggregation, combining different data streams, visualization, stuff like that. And for this purpose, we are creating the Streamer engine. And the Streamer engine has a user interface called the editor, which is based on visual programming. And it looks like this. <coughs> so.
So it allows developers to get their hands dirty with the data very quickly, um, promoting quick prototyping and allowing them to seamlessly combine powerful, scalable off-chain analytics with smart contracts, for example. And we'll do a live demo about this uh, right now. So the demo I'm going to do touches all the layers in the stack, but of course the most visible thing uh, will be the editor, uh, because the, the rest are just infrastructure and they look like APIs, you know, so, so you will see the editor mostly. But it's good to bear in mind that the engine and the editor are just one application uh, on top of the network, so any application can connect to it and produce and consume um, messages. So, let's see what happens. So, let's see if we are on. Okay, so this is the editor, and we're gonna start with an empty canvas, obviously. I'll go to the search and search for a data stream I'm gonna begin with. So this stream is called Public Transport Demo. It actually contains telemetrics information from public transport vehicles running in Helsinki, Finland, which is where I'm from. Um, and you can see on the box, I'm gonna zoom up a little, so there are all the fields uh, contained in the objects in this stream. So to see what the data actually looks like, let me pull up a map. And I'll just connect the vehicle ID over here to ID input on the map, uh, latitude and longitude fields on the map as well. And I'm gonna hit start and see what happens. So we instantly get a real-time view into where the vehicles are at the moment in Helsinki. Right, okay, so what does this have to do with Ethereum and blockchains? Now, <clears throat> let's take a use case. So let's pretend I am Helsinki. No, I'm the mayor of Helsinki, sounds better, okay? <laughs> I'm the king of Helsinki. And, and you guys, uh, you run a transport uh, uh, company, right? And I wanna hire you to run the public transport in my city. But I don't want to make a fixed deal, I mean, pay a fixed sum per year, because that gives me zero guarantees on the quality or quantity of, of your service. So instead, let's make a data-driven smart contract. I'll pay you 100,000 way for each meter traversed by your vehicles. Sounds fair? Okay, let's do it. So what we need is a smart contract first. Now, a cool thing here is we have something called the Solidity module. Uh, it has an edit code button. So I'll first uh, select which account I wanna use. I hit edit code. Um, let me pull up a little template from my text editor. It's a smart contract called pay by use. It's also available on the on the platform. Okay, I hit apply and it should get compiled. I have my uh, constructor parameters over here, so let's initialize the contact with your address, so I'm, I'm paying you, right? So I'm gonna just get some address over here. Okay, paste that. We agreed that I'll pay 100,000 way, and I'll initialize the contract with some test ether and hit deploy. So I can create and deploy smart contracts directly from the interface, and later on I'll show how to connect data to the smart contract that I deployed. So let's wait a while for that to get mined, and in the meanwhile, let's add the computation. So now we have raw data. How do we get from that raw data to actual transactions that we can send to the smart contract? Something is needed in between, right? There's like uh, 
100 events per second coming from that stream, and we definitely don't want to push 100 transactions per second onto Ethereum, so we need aggregation. We also need to calculate the distance that tra uh, the vehicles have traveled from the raw, raw data. So I'll show you another cool trick here. I'm going to add a sub canvas over here. So we have abstractions. Yo, dog, I heard you like boxes inside boxes inside boxes. <laughs> so inside this box, we have more boxes. We have a lot of boxes. Okay. I'm going to connect the vehicle ID and speed. We're going to calculate distance from speed multiplied by time uh, instead of difference in GPS coordinates because that's, that's shady uh, and noisy. Okay. Let's add a chart. Let's see what's happening. We have two outputs. I'm going to zoom in again. One of them says batch, and one of them, one of them says current. I'm going to connect current to the chart. <coughs> so what this box does in addition to calculating the travel distance, it also aggregates it. It accumulates it up to a threshold, after which an event comes out from the batch output. So this should keep rising until my set threshold, which is 1,000. Oh, it's a bit too much, maybe. I'll change it to 500 and see if it works. Just a runtime change. So now we're at 300. Come on. Come on, give me some more. So this, when it reaches 500, it should go back to to zero and start from beginning. And that's the moment when we can commit to the blockchain. So we're aggregating, and every once in a while, we'll commit to the blockchain. And I'll show you in just one second how, how that works. Okay, so this is what we're after, right? One more thing to do, and then we're gonna be ready. So this batch output will send out the the amount uh, before resetting. So that's what we want to report to the smart contract. How do we call this smart contract? I'm going to add a module called Ethereum call. Let's make the calls from the tram demo account. Which contract do we call? This one. OK. Which function do we call? Function called update. So what the function update does it's basically multiplication. So we report how many units uh, we have traveled, and it multiplies that by the preset price, 100,000 way per meter, only for you, my friend. So we connect batch to added units, and we are basically done. So let's add a couple of more things to see what's happening. I'm going to add a table. I'm going to add the batch output to the table. And I'm going to add another table. So we also have the <coughs> events that the smart contract might trigger. There's one called paid amount. I'm going to connect that to the table. So we make the transaction, and we also get a feedback back into the user interface. Now, this is ready. Let's start. See what happens. So, <coughs> sorry, got the Mexican flu or, or whatever. So when we reach 500, we should have a line here indicating that something came out of the batch. There it is. And now there should actually be a pending transaction um, on the testnet. There it is. And when it gets mined, we should get one back over here. Wait for it. These are the longest seconds of my life <laughs> standing here in front of you, just waiting for mining to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. OK, here we go. A few of those actually got, got mined. So, <clears throat> so this is it. Um, <laughs> thanks. So just to 
reiterate what just happened. A sensor, or a bunch of sensors, hundreds of sensors, each in, in a different vehicle, produced data to the streamer network. The streamer network delivered the events in real time to an application, in this case, the streamer engine. The streamer engine called the blockchain. The blockchain answered with events, went back to the streamer engine. The streamer engine produced uh, user interface events, which are, which are also uh, messages in a stream, to back to the network. And those events got delivered directly to my browser via the network in real time. So <clears throat> application developers today, they use various cloud services, typically. They use EC2 for virtual machines, AWS. They use uh, hosted file storage. Um, hosted databases, hosted real-time data pipelines, hosted microservices. Now, the hypothesis is that each one of these layers will be replaced by decentralized counterparts, creating the decentralized cloud. So, for example, Golem will steal business from, from EC2. Swarm and IPFS will slowly start replacing uh, how S3 and other block storage is, is used. So where streamer fits in, the streamer network will um, <coughs> provide decentralized data pipelines, a bit like Amazon Kinesis. Um, the streamer engine will offer similar functionality to, to Amazon Lambda, for example. And blockchain, of course, that's new, right? There's nothing uh, on the cloud side of things. And what the blockchain obviously does is it offers uncheatable state transitions, making the decentralization of the other layers, other services, possible in the first place. So what would this look like uh, from the application developer's point of view? <coughs> so let's say we, an app, we have an application. It runs on a con container. Uh, which is hosted in a decentralized computing service, for example, Golem. Now, <clears throat> this application could be the streamer engine. It could be anything else, web server, microservice, you name it. <clears throat> so what we want is that we have, inside the container, we have access points to these decentralized services um, <clears throat> Which, which allow the application to connect to the different decentralized uh, networks. For example, the streamer client, an Ethereum node, and more, IPFS, uh, whatever. <coughs> and we're, we're collaborating with, with Golem and researching and prototyping how to build this kind of decentralizable application development stack that allows you to write pretty much any application in any language and make that decentralized by running it in a decentralized computation container and use decentralized services um, for it. Okay, so um, I'd like to invite you to, to meet and greet us over beer from five to six today at the Grand Fiesta Americana lobby bar, which is just across the street, would be great to um, meet you all. Um, if you like what you're seeing, follow us at Streamer Inc. on Twitter and join our community chat at chat.streamer.com because we make your streams come true. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <coughs> So there's plenty of time for, for questions. Yep. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, first of all, really cool UI. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. And, uh, you know, because there are incentives for uh, providing data, how do you prevent someone uh, providing a lot of fraudulent data? Yeah. Uh, okay. 
So, of course, we need to prevent flooding the network with, for example, random bullshit, right? So there will be some kind of usage cost uh, for the network, for both the producer and the consumer. So if you're a data producer, um, it's possible that there's also a staking mechanism. So you, may, you need to make some kind of initial investment, or, uh, either in terms of usage fees or staking, uh, expressing your belief that your data is valuable to someone. If that hypothesis is wrong, uh, you basically lose money. So it's a bit like entrepreneurship in general. You have an idea, you think there's value in starting a, a cafe over there, and then you make an initial investment uh, and see what happens. Yeah, so basically if there's a fixed cost for providing this amount of data onto the network per day, you need a certain amount of customers to, to break even, right? So, so you should achieve, uh, aim to achieve that. And that disincentivizes uh, posting uh, or publishing data that doesn't have an audience at all. Or if you use data for, for private purpose, purposes, say you're an organization and you use uh, use the network for internal data. It's not even intended to be uh, sold on the marketplace. You use it for internal analytics or whatever, then you use, uh, you pay the usage fee for, for the network. And those usage fees go to, to the nodes. So it's kind of like mining, but we're not solving this artificial CPU or GPU problem. Uh, instead, uh, we are providing bandwidth to the network. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, are there some mechanisms for uh, cleaning uh, the uh, measurement streams of uh, malicious measurements with some assumptions that at least part of the measurements are to be trusted? Yeah, so I mentioned the reputation system for, for the nodes which helps uh, distribute the responsibility there, but there needs to be another reputation system as well, which is at play uh, on, on the data marketplace. Uh, kind of like you have reviews for, for apps in the App Store, you're gonna have to have a reputation system for streams on the marketplace. Now, if someone is uh, producing malicious content, or infringing copyright, for example. So basically, this is an unsolved problem. So if uh, you could buy a stream from there and then publish it for cheaper uh, or for free. And this kind of activity needs to be disincentivized. But of course, it's hard to exercise censorship in a censorship-free network, right? So, so if you post a movie on YouTube, they can take it down, but if you do that on the network, um, it's, it's impossible. So we can have like community, community voting for unwanted content going on. Uh, the producers might need to stake, stake um, value in there uh, as well. Or we can simply retain a certain amount of centralization on the marketplace so that it can be curated by, by a group of, of curators and actually then we can have a little bit of censorship going on in there. Hey, so I may have missed it, but where exactly is the data stored and, uh, you know, yeah. in the network? So what we have currently um, is a centralized solution built on, on cloud technology and the decentralization of the system will, will take place um, um, from now on. And we haven't yet solved all the details there, so we're early on on that. The basic idea is that the data is persisted on the nodes. We might also use like a decentralized time series database or no SQL database if one that suits our needs uh, uh, pops up. But as this is very um, evolving space at the moment, so it might be that we need to actually build them. <laughs> 
um, <coughs> as well. So it will be stored at the nodes and we need some kind of indexing going on there. So compared to, for example, static files, if you have a static data set or, or a video file, for example, you can uh, a little bit easier handle that. But what we need to do is we need to um, have a search functionality into the data in order to retrieve specific messages or ranges of messages from there. So we'll have that implemented as part of the network. Cool, great. Thanks guys for your attention.